Okay. Well, thank you very much, Karina, for this wonderful introduction. And well, welcome everybody here. It's great to see your names coming in in the chat and uh, also your introductions where you're based. Joseph. Yes, and it's greetings from Tokyo. Uh, we have a beautiful spring uh, evening today and I can feel the breeze coming in. It is now 8 p.m. where here we are. So it's just wonderful to see where everyone is. Wow, look at all this. You know, it's amazing. It's wonderful to see so many people participating all across the globe. Uh, Europe, it's lunchtime webinar. Um, so wonderful to be here. And today's topic, language and cultural learning hand in hand, and we'll focus on the developmental model of lingua culture. Um, Joseph, what do you think? Shall we set, get started with yeah, let's, our slide let's set? Get, let's get started. And maybe give an additional introduction. So welcome everyone. We will be talking about the connection between language and culture. And well, Yvonne and I have been working together. Well, we first met at the CETAR uh, conference in Tallinn, right, Yvonne? Yes. So we have a CETAR Europe connection. And then because of that, it's also extra uh, wonderful to um, have this presentation today. Now, we met actually in Tallinn. It was the Europe Congress in 2013. And I participated in a pre-Congress workshop that Joseph delivered. Um, and it was already about um, how the mind and brain works and how that relates to culture. And it struck me. And from there on, we started uh, exchanging, working together, collaborating until today. Um, so th that's really uh, wonderful that uh, collaborations get started within the CETAR community. And now, of course, I'm based in, uh, in uh in Tokyo, but we have been able to continue our collaboration uh, virtually, which has been wonderful. So I would like to, we're going to be talking about the connection between language and culture learning. And I would first like to get a sense for what people's interests are. And is what is if you could just put a word or two into the chat window, what is your area of professional interest? Are you in, interested in intercultural education? Are you a la language education? Are you in uh, are you doing uh, intercultural training? Just so we can get a sense for the interests of those of you who are here. And already the first lines are coming in. Wonderful to see this. And oh, yes, the chat goes very fast. But we see both language and intercultural coming in, acculturation. Okay, wonderful. It seems like we have DNI professionals. Oh, and here's also a moderating tip, please feel sure that you fill in all panelists and all attendees, otherwise it only reaches us as panelists. Um, but it would be lovely when your chat messages also reach the other uh, participants in uh, today's group. Okay, right, this we is seem the to have a very broad and diverse audience, uh, Joseph. Okay, so we're going to be talking about this connection between language and cultural learning and this is not an academic presentation we're not going to be giving a lot of uh, uh, academic references or theory but i would like you i would like to share with you this link here is a pdf copy of my latest book which talks about the issues that we're going to be discussing today. So for those of you who have a more academic uh, background or interest in that, <laughs> then please take a look at that. And all of the ideas that we're talking about today uh, can be found there. So I see a lot of you working both. Some people seem to be working primarily with language, others primarily with intercultural things, and some who are working in both. So today we're going to be talking about what I sometimes call the odd dilemma of language and culture learning, which is this, uh, which is the fact that 
everyone agrees that language and culture are interrelated. If this is kind of common sense for everybody in this field. At the same time, uh, often in language in classrooms or in intercultural trainings, language and culture learning are treated separately. And this is true both in educational institutions. It's true that linguistics and anthropology are different fields of study. Uh, and the research into language learning is a very separate body of research from uh, research that's into intercultural learning or intercultural communication. So there's this odd thing where we agree that they're interrelated, but in fact, they're often treated separately. And that is this odd dilemma of language and culture learning. So the question that I'd like to be, we're gonna focus on today is, are, is linguistic learning, is learning a language and is cultural learning, are they separate processes? Are they similar processes? Are they different processes? And can we achieve an integrated understanding of this? And the, if you, I have uh, tried to put an enormous amount of literature down into one little box here. But if you are familiar with second language acquisition research, or if you're familiar with research in intercultural learning, in general, research that looks at how people learn languages is quite separate from research which looks at how people learn about culture. And Largely, language learning is looked at in terms of knowledge, in terms of acquiring a symbolic system. It's looked at in terms of habit and skill formation. Cultural learning is often looked at as a kind of higher order form of cognition. We talk about awareness. We talk about intercultural intelligence. Uh, we have developmental models like the, like the DMIS. So broadly speaking, language learning is talked about in more concrete terms at a lower level of abstraction than intercultural learning. And this is something that's so normal to these two fields that I think a lot of people don't even really pay attention to this, but it does create some real problems. And one of the problems for, for example, language teachers is if you say to a language teacher, well, we'd like to include cultural learning in foreign language education. And they'll say, well, how can I add culture to all of this other stuff that I'm doing? And so it can be very difficult to think about language learning and cultural learning in one learning framework. So, Today, we're going to present a learning model that seeks to integrate these two, uh, these two areas into a single learning model. And we're doing this based on recent research into from brain and mind sciences, which is the basis of a lot of the work that Yvonne and I are doing. Yes, exactly. And it's also, it, it started maybe with this main, uh, insight, Joseph, that you gained over time when you were studying, working on your first book, your second book, and thought, where is the new stuff? Is it coming from within our field, intercultural field, language field, or does it come from other disciplines? And just by looking around, and that's also what I vividly remember from the, the time we first met, you said, there's a lot of new things going out there in, well, these fields, cultural neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, cultural psychology, cognitive psychology, social psychology, neurolinguistics, and already all these titles of books, and of course there are many, many more, uh, these all uh, um, are, are just examples of these er new areas of research that are overlapping areas. They are overlapping in many ways, um, but they shed new light and fundamental light on uh, well, also the questions we work with. In our work, we often work with, we, with the phrase rethinking the basic concepts that we work with. And we start also here because many interculturalists use the iceberg, for instance, and well, we need the surface, just this unconscious. But what is this unconscious? What are the unconscious structures of our cognition? And how does that work? So here we can um, withdraw from 
books like or literature from from this work the dual processing of mind and maybe the most famous one of these books is Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman. Um, he also won a Nobel Prize for this work. And what is this all about? It's about the intuitive mind and the attentive mind. They're both working, well, usually they're working in tandem. Um, but what happens is that our attentive mind currently listening to a webinar, it's asked for some energy, mental energy. But the intuitive mind is always there. It's the autopilot. And in learning, we have to look at that aspect too in cognition and maybe we can look at the next slide which is the slide about language also in language it used to be thought of language maybe where is it located in the brain is there one specific area in the brain that's connected to language well it's much more complex than that like many things are much more complex than we might even think of um, and also language um, is it about symbolic meaning and is it just a symbolic system or and that's what this new research is all about is it embodied uh, so the main question here is how does our language relate to cognition and culture and then we start thinking about embodied systems of knowledge and let me just add that much of the work that we're talking about today is if you're interested in if you're on the language side of things uh this book on the left, Louder Than Words, talks about embodied simulation theory, and this is a way to understand that the language use is not simply the manipulation of symbols or concepts, it is a simulation of experience, yeah. that language use is rooted in lived experience. Um, yes, exactly. And we come more to that when we discuss the concept of lingua culture. And then we also uh, had this word here as, as um, well, learning, educational neuroscience, um, main, the book in the middle, Mind, Brain and Education, uh, David Souza looks at learning and learning from a brain mind perspective and what Joseph did in his work first deep culture and later on in 2015 the intercultural mind is applying that to the intercultural field and how does cultural learning change us how is this embodied how do we learn and how can we look at surface and deeper levels so and that's also what we're going to work with uh, today in this well webinar So what are we learning from this new body of research? And you may be familiar with the word lingua culture. The, the, the idea of lingua culture is the idea that language and culture are not separate. They are part of a larger whole. And we know this, for example, that we sometimes talk about a dead language. For example, if a, a language that is dead is a language that does not have uh, a cultural community which is uh, using that language to keep it alive and evolving and changing dynamically. So if from the perspective of, the ne of neuroscience or the neurocognitive perspective of language and culture, we can see that lingua culture uh, can be looked at such that language itself, the explicit linguistic forms that we use, the words that we use, the sounds and language, this linguistic meaning, this is out in the world and this is what we're using with each other, of course, as we speak, as we write. Linguistic meaning, of course, does not come from dictionaries. Linguistic meaning is intuitive. We have an intuitive understanding of what things mean. And that intuitive meaning comes from our shared commun of our shared experience within a linguistic community. And in that sense, language, linguistic meaning is very much rooted in 
the shared cultural experiences of a community. Now, this doesn't mean that there's only one true uh, cultural community that corresponds to one language. Obviously, this is not the case. Language and culture are both complex and dynamic. You can think of them as ecosystems, not as single things. So any given language will have multiple ecosystems. But it is language and culture are both emergent properties. Interaction among individuals creates and makes language and culture evolve. And as cultural communities interact, what things mean evolves and language evolves together with it. And so we can, so this neurocognitive perspective shows us this extremely close relationship between language and culture. And if this is the relationship between language and culture from the neurocognitive perspective, the question then becomes, well, what then is language learning and what then is cultural learning? And I think you can see that the top half of this is tends to be more explicit conscious elements. And down here at the bottom, we have deeper intuitive implicit elements of experience and of mind. So let's create another picture that, okay, if this is lingua culture, then this is what we need to do. When we want to learn a foreign language, we need to learn linguistic patterns. Yes, we need to study, we need to have a conscious learning process of linguistic patterns. But we also need to have an experiential learning process of sociocultural patterns. And these two, of course, need to go together. And these need to be and this is a process that has to happen both at the level of the attentive mind where we are consciously focusing on things. For example, this is conscious studying or maybe conscious reading a Wikipedia article about a foreign place. Um, but we also need an experiential trial and error pattern recognition process, which is going on at the level of the intuitive mind. And of course, these two mental processes need to work together. Uh, and when they're working together, we're in flow. We're having a flow experience. So what we're talking about today is trying to think about language and cultural learning as this unified, integrated process and see how we can make sense of this process in a way which can help language learners and in a way which can help cultural learners so that we can see these as a single process. So. This is a kind of quick and dirty image of what we're talking about. To take this to the next step, let's, we want to ask the question, if this is the process of embodying new linguistic and cultural patterns, how can we make sense of that process? Are there different levels? Are there different, what is the process that we go through? So we'd like to ask you, This is the first uh, kind of brief reflection question. And so your reflection question is, what do these circles represent? This is just a, a kind of guessing, thinking question. Given what we've seen so far, what do these circles represent? OK. Let's see. Let's the see what we've got. one's coming in. We've got integration, assimilation, the foreign becoming familiar, internalization of new content, integration process, immersion, acculturation, culture shock and integration, and understanding, flow process, communication process, external to internal. So as we look at these, so do a little bit of a kind of meta thinking here as, as these words are, are scrolling by. Um, so I notice a couple of things. One is that some of these are relating. So one of them was foreign, was integration of foreign, something foreign. Yeah, one to was internal from external to, to internal. To, yeah. To external to internal. One of them, uh, Deborah Hardeman said, oh, so Deborah, yours has gone to the panel. Oh, many of these are just to panelists. So many of these, I've now seen that a number of these uh, are not being visible to yeah. 
So when you send these, please uh, make sure that you're sending this to panelists and attendees. So I'm just going to read a couple that I can see external to internal integration of knowledge, process of ethno relativism. So just these three, which I just said, external to internal, integration of knowledge, process of ethno relativism, all of those things can be related, can be represented by these circles embodying a concept. Um, and our, our contention and the main point of our presentation today is that this circle rep can represent language learning in the same way that it can learn, it can represent cultural learning. And in fact, it can represent any complex skill. Now, these four levels were not simply created randomly. They were created using something called dynamic skill theory. And we're going to be talking about that in just a moment. But I'd like to look a little bit more at what we mean by these four levels before we get into any kind of theory. And so also, we're going to yeah, yes. let's make it interactive. Um, because that's what I really enjoy seeing all your responses in the chat. And when we go to the next slide, is mainly many of you working internationally with groups in cultural training. Joseph, can you show the next slide? Um, you hear something like, yeah, I understand Moroccan culture. I went to Casablanca. And listening to the language and how people express themselves in the way they talk about culture and cultural learning and how to master learning another culture is interesting. And this brings us to those questions, what are different levels of intercultural understanding? And how do people develop these higher levels of intercultural understanding? Now let's just have a little exercise here. And it, here I'm, you see. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just so this is when we were talking about the previous slide where we said language learning on one side and cultural learning on the other side. So this is the kind of question that those who are interested in, in cultural learning theory want to understand. What are these the process for cultural learning? So yeah. yeah. So and what is this process? So what we're going to do now is we have in the next slide, but first we show this slide, we have these four people with a balloon where they make a statement and the main question is what do you need to do to understand culture and we have four different responses and what we want to ask you is read those responses and then rank these answers from the least to the most sophisticated so the least sophisticated response first the name of that person to the most sophisticated so yes let's show so slides the next slide so imagine if Juna is the least and Gilma is second and Burke is third and, and Milpo is the highest, then you just write Juna, or you can just do J, G, B, M, or you can write the four names, least to highest, uh, and put your answers before you look at what anyone else is. Uh, actually, maybe we could ask people to not put anything for 30 seconds and <laughs> write it down and we could all set it in at the same time. But, but first you have to show this slide. Yes, yep. Exactly. <laughs> so otherwise, okay. Uh, so take some time to read this. And then who is the yourself. more, the more sophisticated or less sophisticated cultural learner? Yeah, starting with the least sophisticated first. So one is and the lowest. Please slide, write down all four names or all four first letters of these names. Um, yes, I see yeah. many people do the first letters. That's fantastic. Yeah. And we just so. wait a little longer before we sort of try to make sense of your responses. You're with so many, so <laughs> it goes amazingly fast. But yeah. we see a lot of responses starting with the G, and I think I see that pattern quite often. So what yeah. I see often is Dilma, Burke, Juna, Milpo, and there is some change. Sometimes it's Burke first, and also yeah. 
that's the so, major change probably right. who, whom so, to start with first yes yeah, the answer you can... quite consistent it's either milpo juna or juna milpo okay right. so it's there is definitely a pattern of these answers so you have a sense for who is more sophisticated and who is less sophisticated and that's interesting isn't it joseph and the, the main question here is how do you know how did you tell by just having in, in a couple of split seconds having a look at those responses and you had the sense of these patterns and maybe you can also write that down how did you know what what, what was it that made you click and, and write down these responses shall i go on yvonne or yeah we can say the right the yeah, okay, here's a couple of responses reflecting on my own journey, the verbs they use, interesting, intuition. So there's a connection to the intuitive understanding, what we've been talking about, the intuitive mind, experience, gut feeling, that also all relate to the intuitive mind. Um, oh, facts versus perspectives. This is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Goes from surface to deeper and intuitive. Exactly. Well, and that's, correct if we have a look here it all starts and this is not about right and wrong and let's make that clear it's it's about levels a process flow and know the important facts and figure about the place that's often where we get started if we don't know where Antananarivo is and uh, that's the capital for Madagascar what language do they speak in Madagascar and it's plural many languages that's where you is your starting point and then Understanding etiquette and cultural do's and don'ts is already more advanced level. And from there we continue, Joseph, don't we? Shall we? Uh, so are we, are we going through these and then going to the next slide? Yeah, why don't we okay. go through this? Yeah, because there's okay. a paradigm shift. So, so we can see, and as, as your answer says, that Juna saying that learn to see things from the, from the local perspective, that is quite a different uh, that is a very different answer from uh, Burke's do's and don'ts yeah. or from Gilma's facts and figures. Uh, that's really a, a big shift. And then, of course, Milpo uh, has even a more, uh, a more abstract or uh, more meta perspective than Juna. So the question then becomes, what is this progression that we're looking at and what we would like to argue today is that this progression is not unique to cultural learning, that this is a progression that we can find through the learning of any complex skill, and we can understand it if we understand how the brain learns complex skills. Yeah, exactly. So if we go to the next slide there, we see, and we also put here learning in our brains, and it's about neural networks. And not to make this complex, but this is just all you need to know. To learn something new, anything new, the brain must make new networks of neurons. So it always starts with one neuron connecting to the other. And from there, these connections make networks. And then we get networks upon networks. So it creates and grows uh, like an ecosystem, you could say. And then these networks start to work as a system. And maybe we can explain this process also with a very practical uh, example, Joseph. Uh, yeah, go so, ahead. So the, any, any complex skill that you learn needs to start with individual skills or pieces of information. So if you're gonna learn tennis, you need to learn how to hit a forehand, you need to learn how to hit a backhand, and those are individual skills which, which you need. Now, we... Um, but you cannot simply do that if you want to learn to play tennis. You need to go on and you need to start a process of mapping where you, for example, do serve and receive or forehand to backhand. And you start to make connections between these different skills. But even this does not let you play tennis. You're still only learning the structure of tennis. You're kind of internalizing the structure in more complex forms. To play tennis, requires a whole different level of experience. And that is once you are have internalized the strokes, you've earned, internalized the rules of the game, you have someone else, you have a tennis court, then tennis happens. Tennis is not happening here. 
this is the structure of tennis. This is the game of tennis. And this is a mapping process. And this is a holistic process where the game of tennis emerges as greater than the sum total of its part. This is, so in that sense, tennis is an emergent property. It is more than the sum total of its parts. And this is something that from the brain's perspective, this is when things emerge into a holistic understanding. But of course, even if you have a systems level understanding of tennis, there is another level that you can go on beyond that where you can become a tennis coach, where you not only can play tennis, but you may be able to know different strategies, different ways to train people. So there is a higher level of a meta level understanding of tennis that's beyond being able to play the game. So this is a tennis example. These four levels come from dynamic skills theory. Uh, this was developed by Kurt Fisher, who's an educational psychologist at Harvard. And I think you can see where we're going with this. This organizational principle is universal for all complex skills. And we can see that it works when we're talking about learning as well. And these four levels that we were just talking about can easily be put into this framework. I'll just let you look at this for a moment. Notice that you understood these levels of sophistication without any explanation, just by hearing people speak, because you have an intuitive understanding of these levels. And you have that intuitive understanding because you have deep language and culture learning experience. If you do this same activity with people who do not have your level of understanding, you will get different answers. You are basing this. So one of the key insights we believe from this is that cultural learning and cultural understanding is primarily an intuitive form of knowledge. It is not a higher form of cognition in the sense of being this higher level function. It is intuitive knowledge that is gained through experience and trial and error. So we've seen this in terms of cultural learning. But here's your next task. Same thing, but now same thing. applied for language. And just have a look again. Take some time to read it through. And also write down the names in the order from least sophisticated to most sophisticated. The first one coming in. Mm -hmm. So, who is the the beginner? Who is the yeah, advanced? The beginner. Yeah. Who is the advanced language learner? Who is the beginning language learner? Okay. Well, here is some differentiation in the responses. Okay. Well, we have quite a, an amount of responses already. What is the pattern that we overall see? It either starts with Burke or with Jilma is what I digest from your responses yeah. in the chat. I think that's where the main starting yeah. point is. But you do have a lot, a, quite some variety here in responses, more maybe than in the cultural case. Mm -hmm. OK, Joseph, you want to explain sure. how this works in this case? So one of the ways that you can think about these four statements is in terms of what is the process that a language learner goes through as they learn a foreign language. And as you 
probably have experienced, a beginning language learner has a very different experience of language learning than an advanced language learner. Or if you're learning another foreign language after already having learned one, your experience is very different. That when you're learning a foreign language, the first thing that you need to do is you need to learn words and you need to learn discrete pieces of information about language, discrete knowledge. As you learn language, as you learn these words, you also have to start learning the structure of the language. And that could be the learning of grammatical structures, you're learning the rules of the language, but it also could be, uh, you could be learning uh, pronunciation. You could start with pronouncing individual sounds, but then you start to learn how to pronounce words or sentences. You're creating this, you're doing going through a mapping process. But as you know, learning a foreign language, it's not enough to make sentences. It's not enough to, in your mind, say, okay, I will go, let's see, future tense, will, or I'm, is it going to, or is it will? No, I will go to the store uh, on Tuesday. Is it in Tuesday, on Tuesday preposition? No, it, you have to go beyond that so that you get to the point where you're using the language as a holistic, in a holistic way. And we sometimes talk about this as fluency practice. And that at this point, it's becoming more integrated into your mind and you start to focus on meaning rather than focusing on structures. And at this point, and, and as you know, this is, a, this is a big difference between forming sentences in your mind and having some fluency in the language. At the systems of systems level, it's the same distinction that we had with the cultural learning. This is the point at which rather than not that you can not just speak a foreign language, but you may end up being a language teacher, for example, where you understand language from different perspectives. Maybe you study linguistics, maybe you study education. I think you can see where we are going here. This diagram here represents a learning process that is universal to anyone learning a complex skill. And it can be used to talk about language learning and it can be used to talk about cultural learning. And the four circles are related to how the learner experiences this process at this I1 level, and the I refers to integrating or identity as we integrate foreign, as we embody and integrate foreign patterns into ourselves, at first it feels foreign. Then as it gets more integrated, we, we start to internalize it. At the I3 level, it becomes more of a natural part of who we are. And at the I4 level, it is totally integrated into other aspects of our life. This model seeks to answer the question that we started at, that we started with, which was, how do we look at language and culture not as two separate processes, but something that is embodied, something that is drawing on our wrong slide, both our intuitive mind and our attentive mind, something which integrates both language and culture as in, as a, in a holistic way, and something which can be understood intuitively by learners, uh, that it's easy. And if you show these circles to cultural learners in a training or a class, or if you show these circles to language learners, you will have them guessing, uh, they will be understanding this process intuitively without the need for much explanation. So our goal today has been to, to present this learning model, which we have been working with. Uh, now, Yvonne and I have been using this model in intercultural training and education. I have been using this learning model doing, I teach a class uh, in an MA TESOL course for language teachers, uh, where we teach an integrated approach to language and cultural learning. 
Uh, so we have used this model both in culture learning contexts, as well as language learning contexts, and as well as contexts where we are combining them. And so maybe Yvonne, you, you want to mention what how this has been for you to be working with this model in the cultural learning context. Yes, I mainly worked in the cultural context with this model. And for me, it helps. It helped first me to get more clarity on how this process goes. And then as, as a trainer, help well, participants understand the process and it mainly works on when people come with the main question, I want to get well, some practical do's and don'ts. We're all familiar with that question when a client knocks on the door or also the participants in the room. That's what they expect from a cultural trainer and how to well, almost make a paradigm shift. But come to looking at culture, uh, the double cultural perspective, uh, look at things from more than one cultural perspective. And then this is very helpful also for the participants themselves. And maybe that brings us to this great audience because you have been with us all the time. Uh, and I'm sure there are many questions and uh, probably you can use the Q&A box to post those questions um, because we throw have thrown a lot at you in these first 40 minutes of of the webinar and uh, so maybe our uh, facilitators uh, you're already yeah. here Karina so and Christine you so could help gonna, us out so we're going to be moving on to that in just one one more moment I just wanted to make one more uh, little comment the, notice the arrows be, at the bottom of the screen here between these boxes these arrows are important this is not a stage model this is, these are levels of complexity, of complexity of the cognitive systems that are being used and of the phenomenology of the intercultural experience and the phenomenology of language learning. In other words, when you're learning a new language in one moment, you may be looking up a word in a dictionary. At another moment, you may be speaking fluently. At another moment, you may be thinking abstractly. And the same is true for cultural learning. We process, we have these experiences at different levels. So it's not the case that once you go to the systems, you never go back to data. Having said that, if you have very little cultural experience, you may only think of cultural learning as cultural facts if you simply have never experienced it otherwise. If you have very little language learning experience, you've never experienced speaking a foreign language fluently, you will not, un you will not the I3 experience will not be embodied. So it is both a developmental model but it is a model with levels and not stages. So for those of you who are kind of learning theorists, the difference between a learning between, uh, between uh, stages and levels is an important one. So those were just a couple of, uh, a couple of things to, to throw in for the more theoretically minded. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I think it's uh, maybe time when we can uh, have some interaction. What do you think? Yeah, great. No, Shall maybe, I stop sharing or should we? Maybe just stop sharing and then we have the full screen. Unfortunately, yeah. we cannot see the participants, but we see Karina in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. But, so this will mean that people can, if people, anyone who wants to take a screenshot of this right now, if you want to be able to look at it while we, uh, while we speak, you're welcome to do that. Uh, we don't have a way to look at this while when we stop sharing. And we might also announce that we are recording podcasts. So the latest one is Beyond Do's and Don'ts. It's exactly about this model. Um, and it's just out there. So uh, you can look it up on the website of Japan Intercultural uh, Institute. Yeah, I mean, if you want more information, man, we have more information than you. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, first of all, the book that, I, that I've sent, there are also academic articles. Uh, Yvonne and I do a podcast. Uh, we do online. We do online courses. The the work that a lot of the work that Yvonne and I are doing is sponsored by the Japan Intercultural Institute, which is a non an NPO. So I encourage you, if you're interested in following up, uh, I encourage you to um, to look at that. So, Karina, unfortunately, we can't see the participants, but I'm going to be the voice uh, for them. <laughs> 
the first question uh, is by Anne, and she's asking uh, if language and culture are so intertwined, does this mean that we have to get rid, um, have to rid our language of all vocabulary that has a negative impact on racism? This is a, a complex question. It's kind of a bit beyond what we're looking at today, but I would just say that when I say dog, the image that comes to your mind is not simply a concept. It relates to your experience with dog. With dogs. It may be a German shepherd. It may be a poodle, depending on your experience. So we use language that reflects our experience. And so racist language is a reflection of our embodied experience. It's a reflection of, em of embodied racism. So... Um, it's not a simple thing to change experience through changing language. So um, that is, we actually, we did a podcast uh, about bias, uh, which I could recommend. It's called Bias is Not Bias. Uh, there's a whole new body of stuff. So this is a really uh, something to, to explore. Yeah, but um, it's not so easy. No. It's not, a, yeah, it's no, not an exactly. easy. No, yeah. but thanks for asking. Thank Very you. This, important. yeah, it's a deep yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Next question is by Bernd, and he is asking, do you believe that speakers of different language uh, experience really a uh, reality differently because of the structure and the semantics of their native language? Yeah, good question the, as well. There's, a, <laughs> there's, the, there's, so I'll just try to give a 30, 30 second technical answer for someone. There, there's a hundred years of research about the sapir wharf hypothesis, which tries to find the uh, connections between language and perception. I think we have gone to a new paradigm now. And the new paradigm is that language use is a reflection of lived experience, as like the example I was giving with the dog. So, or to an American, if you say the 4th of July, that's different than July 4th for an American. For an American, the 4th of July is the national holiday. July 4th is the day after the 3rd of July. So, if you're interested in this question, I recommend learning about embodied simulation theory, this book by Benjamin Bergen. And so linguistic meaning is connected to cultural experience is the short answer. But again, this is, you know, this is a hundred year old question. So, <laughs> and my personal experience is speaking Japanese. It really twisted my, it does twist my mind around but it forces me to experience the world in a new way, as, a, as I'm sure many of you have experienced. It's hard to quantify that, though. Do you want to add something, Yvonne? No, well, you're the language expert of the two of us, so I just keep the language questions to you. And that's what I also thought. And also, when we look at cultural neuroscience, we see that our brains are also wired differently. Um, so it's so much more complex. There's so much more to it. And uh, language is the expression. Uh, so yes, um, this is where, where, where it goes, but the, the, the complexity is clear. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, we're, we're happy to, hear, to be in touch with people if any want to follow up on any of these questions or if we don't get to everything. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Alexander is asking if you could please give a concrete example of how to combine language and cultural teaching or learning based on knowledge, rules, meaning, or meta perspective. So read the book. I can also send you an article. But the, the short answer is you teach language as a form of cultural learning. So you're not adding culture to language. What you're doing is you're framing the language learning task as a form of cultural learning. So you help learners see that as they're learning language, they need to integrate this foreignness into themselves. And there are ways to do it at each of those four levels. So yeah. when you're at the, at the vocabulary level, there are ways to connect that to cultural learning. When you're at the I2 level, there are ways to connect it at that level. So the question is finding the, the um, connections at each of these four levels and helping the learner see these two things as a, as a similar process. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. reframing the whole thing. Yeah. And probably many language teachers already do so or experiment with it, and especially the ones who have been 
having yes. this personal experience themselves, they have these stories, they can express it, they can relate it. And that's also what makes learning a language so much richer. I have experienced myself learning Spanish, for instance, and I also talk about that in the podcast, very dry and, and only the grammar and the rules. Well, it didn't really work. It was only once I was there. So I would have benefited from a language teacher who could integrate it so much more from the beginning. Uh, and and th that could be a huge challenge. I, I think that a lot, some language teachers struggle. They, they have little pieces that they add. It's harder to have an, an integrated kind of overall framework. So that's what we're trying to, trying to provide is a, a larger framework. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, the next question for Patrick, and he says, uh, you didn't talk about the effective aspects. So acquiring local tastes, likes, uh, dislikes, which is neither abstract knowledge nor simple practice. So how do we assimilate not in steps, but by taking the leap of faith? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, would you like me to try that, Yvonne? Or? Yeah, what, I, what comes to my mind, of course, all international work or acculturation, language acculturation uh, is, is an intuitive process and it's, it's very emotional and personal. And that's also where the intuitive mind comes in. You might think, oh yes, I like going to another country uh, also as, as something you should do once in your career. But then once you're there, it's such a diff different aspect and also practicing and, and also practicing the language or speaking the language, that's a very, well, emotional journey. So uh, what you say, a, a leap of faith in the unknown. And I'll just add by saying that the, the diagram that we showed with these little neural connections, that can give the impression that we're saying that this is primarily information processing. That's not what we're saying. This is not simply information processing. This is an embodied experience at all of these levels. So when you're learning new vocabulary words, this it's you can learn it as a more abstract task, or you can learn it in a more embodied way. So what we're what we're saying is that language learning should be not just how much are learning, but how deep is that learning process. So you're absolutely right. Effective aspects, trial and error, embodied learning processes, experiential learning, um, meaningful learning. Um, so great, great question. And the leaps, leaps of faith, these are aha moments. These aha moments are intuitive connections and leaps of faith are when we go to this higher, more holistic understanding. Great question. And the next question is by Becky and she's asking, where do you suggest teaching starts with regards to your model? So I'm, she's guessing it's not from left to right, but this sounds like it's most intuitive for the learner in some ways. In, in my work, I use this at the beginning of a learning period as an overall framework to help learners understand the overall process that we're going to be going through so that I can refer back to this. So it's a way to create a kind of roadmap for learners. And if you show this diagram, learners will say, oh, well, yeah, you know, in Spanish, I, I'm at I2 because I can make these sentences, but I only once in a while can I get to I3. So you can, you can talk about, okay, well, in, you know, we're going to do some fluency practice today and use this vocabulary. So tr let's see if you can get to the I3 today. And you're trying to get learners to experience things at these higher levels. But you first need to provide this framework so that they see, they can kind of embody, they can kind of have a feeling for this overall process. I also have articles with my book, which kind of, uh, which kind of, speak to this question and send me an email i'm happy to send you more than you could <laughs> more than you could possibly want yeah. <laughs> kind of obsessed <laughs> no and in my experience also more in in well business like uh, training context but working with this model from the start and only a couple of slides or maybe one but it gives an intuitive understanding of the process and mainly those neuro Net, the neurons making networks, etc., from data to mapping to systems, to systems of systems, and then people understand where the intercultural fits in. Yes. Thanks for asking. Maybe Joseph, because um, you just also said uh, sent me an email. There was a question in the chat as well: how to best contact the two of you? Um, uh, we can um, share that as well for our participants. So. I'm going to put my email address in the chat window. 
just That's just perfect. Just very yeah. quick, quick and quick and dirty way to do it. Um, I'll also add mine. Um, so just reach out to any of us. And as you've understood, Joseph had written all these books published on this. So, and, but of course, reach out to both of us uh, whenever you feel. Um, and I put the, the website for the Japan Intercultural Institute. It's the NPO, which sponsors the podcast that we do and uh, just a wide range of the things that we're working on. And I can, I am, we're happy to give you a copy of the PowerPoint slides. Yeah. Uh, just send us an email and we will be happy to give them to you. Perfect. I think we have still some time for some question. So let's go further with uh, Julia. And she's asking, do you think that the development of AI has got an influence in the learning of lang languages and culture? Do I think that the development of EI? Is that emotional intelligence? Is emotional that... intelligence. Um, interesting. Um, it must. <laughs> you would think so. I mean, so I think this, I'm just going to go off on a little thing here because Second language acquisition often treats language as though it's simply an information system, but the psychology of language learning is so much deeper than that. We have resistance to a foreign language when it doesn't feel comfortable with all this effort we have to make. And so, yes, it does require emotional intelligence to manage our own learning process. We talk about self-efficacy. We talk about autonomous learning. So absolutely, any embodied process where we're integrating all this foreignness into ourself uh, definitely requires this kind of deeper uh, development. And I think we should be teaching languages as a personal challenge of personal growth, not as a way to get a better job. You know, we, we should be focusing on this, on this aspect much more, is my personal opinion. So that's, I've gone off on my little my little speech there. So thank you for <laughs> listening. Yeah. Uh, maybe one final question. Um, the concept reminds me of the concept signifi and significant. This is a basis for yours. The, so this is, uh, these concepts uh, come from linguistics. This is not where the starting, this is, it may be related and I think it is related, but it's not the the it's not what informs this particular model um yeah so that without getting into linguistics it's hard to talk about that but yeah that, that's not where it comes from thank you great yeah i think we are um running out of time or we're reaching the end uh, of the webinar unfortunately we cannot answer all of the questions but uh, i think you the two of you were, were open to answer any questions via mail as well. So if you're really uh, interested and if you want to like um, have that an uh, question answered, I think uh, Yvonne, Joseph, you're open to answer them via mail as well, right? Oh, yes, and we are. Absolutely. And just yeah. put any any comments that you have about reactions, just put it in the chat window and just tell us, you know, how you, how some, anything that comes to mind. And um, yeah, it would be wonderful to see what we, you take away. What? <laughs> yeah, we really, you... we really are happy to know that because this is not a conventional way to look at things. Uh, this is not with standard theorizing in second language acquisition. It is also not standard theorizing in cultural learning. So it does require a different framework. Heavy meal, much to digest now. That's a great comment. <laughs> okay, thanks, Vincent. <laughs> no, I still see those wonderful questions uh, coming in. So please come to us with with an email, and we come back to you. Well, thank you so much for being here and and being such and a check great out the audience. Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we couldn't see your faces and hear your voices, but we hope to have another opportunity. So. Thank you very much, Yvonne and Joseph. This was really inspiring. Our next webinar will be on the 21st uh, of July on the interplay of death and culture. Uh, it's also going to be a very interesting talk. So I hope I see all of you there. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.